Hey, I want to welcome in all of our campuses online, Garrison, Dickinson, everybody in Bismarck. Come on, can you say hello to everybody who's watching online right now? We're so grateful that each and every one of you are here, and uh, I want to say welcome to all of those of you that are watching in correctional facilities right now, too. We're so grateful that you're joining us. Come on, give them a shout out. And uh, man, you know, a couple years ago, I was on a missions trip, and we were in the country of Chile in South America, and uh, we were going to these schools and orphanages, and we had prepared songs and skits and all these stuff to teach people about Jesus. And uh, we were going around all these different places, and I remember going to this one school, and there were, it was a rather large team. I think we had about 20 young adults who were there, who were all a part of this. And, uh, and we went to this one school, and uh, I realized that <clears throat> at this school, nobody was paying attention to most of our team. That all these high schoolers and middle schoolers and whoever was there was all rushing to this one place. And uh, they were rushing to like make a crowd or a circle. There was all this clamor over on the side of the building. And I thought, what is this craziness? Like, what is happening? Who showed up? Who's here right now uh, that we didn't know was going to be here? What kind of celebrity or person is in this place that we didn't know was going to be here today? And uh, I started to hear murmurs that um, Justin Bieber was at the school at the same day that we were. And I thought, well, that's really crazy. I might have to meet him, you know, if that's what's going on. And I, I looked over and found my way to the middle of the crowd, and I met Justin Bieber. <laughs> and seriously, all the students were convinced that Justin Bieber was on our team. But if you don't know, that's our pastor, Sam Hapip, right there. <laughs> but let me, let me show you how serious this got. I mean, he was signing. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if he was signing Justin or Sam, actually, but... He might have been faking it. Teenage girls lined up everywhere to take a picture <laughs> with Justin Bieber. <laughs> Crazy. If, I'm not going to embarrass him more, but he's grown out of that phase of, I mean, seriously, the rest of the week they were taking celebrity shots and it was crazy, it's crazy, but uh, have you ever been in a situation where somebody walked in the room and, every, and they grabbed everybody's attention the moment they walked in? Are there people that right now, if they came in the room, they'd be they would grab your attention, that you would clamor to them and and crowd around them and and want to know what they thought about things. Is there a celebrity or a politician or a hero in your life that if they were in the room, all your attention would focus on them? And I want to give you a message today entitled, Make Way for the King. Make way in your life, make way for the King. See, in the time of Jesus, there was a lot of people that would have caused a clamor. There were religious leaders and Pharisees and Sadducees that if they walked in the room, everybody would have wanted their approval. Everybody would have wanted to be on the right side of these people. And so they would have clamored around these people or at least tried to put on their best to get approval from these people. There were Roman officers, Pontius Pilate and Caesar, that surely if they were to walk into a room, everybody would have their attention. The the human power that these people carried was immense and incredible At that time in their world, they demanded loyalty from people. The religious leaders wanted loyalty. The Romans demanded loyalty. But then there was Jesus, this rogue rabbi who had traveled around the Sea of Galilee and caused a stir who, in his own humble way, caused people's loyalty. They caused them to, he caused them to be allied to him, to to even give their allegiance to him. And he was creating quite quite a stir around Galilee, and as we'll see today, even around Jerusalem itself. And, you know, as Americans, we don't really like the concept of a king. In fact, we're kind of founded on being (laughs) anti-king. But the way of the kingdom and where things are headed in in our world, for those of us that follow Jesus, is that we're not citizens of the earth, we're citizens of heaven. And in that heaven, it is a theocracy where Jesus alone reigns. That it's not really, see, we know all about our, our rights and uh, as Americans and our, what we deserve as people and what we want, but all of that gets set aside when Jesus walks in the room. Because it's no longer about that, it's about what he's doing. It's about what the king is up to in our lives. There are all sorts of things 
demanding your attention, people clamoring for your attention, social media influencers wanting your clicks and wanting your views and wanting your likes, little kings on the earth who want to express human power and act like they are the beginning and the end, trying to draw attention away from the king. And this was the controversy of Jesus' day that One group of people wanted loyalty, another group of people demanded loyalty, and then Jesus comes into town in Matthew 21, and his disciples bring him a donkey and and the colt and and put on it their cloaks. They're already honoring him more than themselves. They're laying their cloaks on him and on this donkey and on the road in front of him, and it says, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Praise the Lord, but praise this king in the highest. No other king above him. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this guy? Who is this king? The religious leaders were like, who is this king? The Romans said, who is this king? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the rogue rabbi who's been around Galilee and now the people are shouting out Hosanna and essentially Hosanna means save us. It says, oh, save or, or pray, save us. And they're shouting to this guy that they called a prophet that the religious leaders didn't know what to do with, that the Romans maybe felt threatened by and They're saying, save us to this guy who seemingly in the measure of power at that time seemed to be too humble to be able to do anything great. How do you suppose the kings of the earth, the religious leaders and the Romans would feel about crowds gathering around Jesus, setting their cloaks on his donkey, laying palm branches where he walked and declaring, Jesus of Nazareth, save us. But I just want to say it clearly across all of our campuses, everybody watching today, in a world that feels in chaos and people fighting for power, in an election year in the United States of America, with social media and influencers who want to demand and crave our attention, there is only one king. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not many different ways up the mountain of God. Through different spiritual practices, through a mixture of religions, through a little bit of Eastern work and a little bit of Western work and a little bit of God in the middle, worshiping many gods, there is one king. And the Bible is clear that that king is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Father and who is the Holy Spirit. They are one in the Trinity. He's the light of the world. He was with God at the beginning. He was the creator who wrapped himself in skin and came in the flesh to save each and every one of us. He's the only door into relationship with our heavenly father. He is the gate. He's the only way in. He's our creator. He's our savior and he's our king. And even today in these moments, we welcome him because his word says that when we gather in his name, there he is in the midst of us. That by his Holy Spirit, he fills this temple. What is this temple? It's now those that follow him. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And he's here today working in our midst because we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You cannot ask the king to come reign in his kingdom if you are not in allegiance to the king. He comes and he reigns when his kingdom comes and reigns in our lives. And today I wanna show you why Jesus alone is the only king worthy of your heart. While other little kings and culture in its voice, the princes of the air, the princes of the earth will vie for your attention while Jesus is the only one worthy of your heart. Psalm 24 shows us this king. says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Why is it the Lord's? For he has founded it upon the seas, and he established it upon the rivers. The earth is the Lord's, for he has founded it. Jesus is our king, but he's also our 
creator. He's the absolute owner over everything that exists. If you pick up an item in your home and you look on the bottom or open the cover, you can see made in China or made in the USA or made in Taiwan. But when it comes to anything in this world, we are deceived if we think all that I have belongs to me and was made by me. Because God is the owner of all things. Every single thing, everybody listening, hearing my voice right now has been stamped, made by God. In fact, you've been made in the very image of God. The world belongs to him because he created it. This is important because the arguments about the origins of the earth are not actually arguments about the origins of the earth. They're actually arguments about who's really in charge. Because God, if, if God is not creator, then he has no right to sovereignty. But if Jesus was with God in the beginning and he created the heavens and the earth, as Genesis 1.1 says, and God is the creator, then he's in charge. Then it all belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, for he has founded it upon the seas. That gives him the exclusive right to claim kingship over everything that is including each one of us here today. He's the creator, and therefore, he's in charge. If Jesus is king over all, and he is in charge, then we owe him our allegiance. Whether you're here at this campus, or watching online, or at one of our other campuses right now, if Jesus is in charge, then we owe him our allegiance. And Psalm 24 shows us what it means to be in allegiance to the king. It says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? You know, kings, when, when they would build kingdoms, they would build them in a place where an enemy would have to climb a hill to get to them. Or they'd surround it with water. We went to one place in Israel that Herod had built that was... That was that was up on, on top of a mountaintop that you, you couldn't even, you can't even get there now except getting on like a ski lift to get up to it. Because it was easy to defend, it was where the king was. And so God tells us in the scripture, who actually can ascend that place? Who is allowed to climb the hill, not just to where the king is, but into the most holy place of the king? Who's allowed to go there? And he gives us the clue when he says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. What does that scripture really mean? He who has clean hands means he who has outward obedience. Somebody who is outwardly, obviously in allegiance to the king. That your life speaks a better word than the words out of your mouth. Is there evidence that you follow the king in your obedience? Can other people look at your life and say, that's someone who follows Jesus? That's somebody who is in allegiance to the king. Maybe they know the other kings of the earth that you follow and what you're into, but above and beyond that, do they know that you're in allegiance to the king? It's, it's outward obedience, but many of us get that wrong because we think it's only about outward obedience. And so we, we play the part and we do all the right things and we try to look like we're living in outward obedience, but in the inside, nothing has actually changed. Jesus corrected the Pharisees in this way and he said, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is still moldy and gross. So it's not just clean hands, but it's also a pure heart. What is a pure heart? That's inner integrity. It's inward integrity coupled with outward obedience because Jesus doesn't just test our actions, he judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts through his word. This is why the word of God is so important, why it's a double-edged sword, because it, it tests whether or not we're actually living uh, what we're speaking. It tests whether or not we're actually in allegiance to the king. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hearts, has outward obedience, but also ha clean hands, but also pure hearts. They have an inner integrity, an inward integrity that guards their life. The next part is that a person who does not lift up their soul to what is false. This is really like the command that there shall be no other gods before you. That you, you can't, in, in following Jesus, and I've talked about this already, have Jesus and then all these other little gods. That's what the Israelites did when they were collected. They said, or when they were corrected, they would say, you know, we're going to follow Yahweh, but we're also going to keep Baal in our back pocket just in case God doesn't come through for us. So I'm going to add mixture. 
I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm also going to hold on to these other things that aren't in line with God's word, kind of as my backup plan. And so I read my horoscope every day, or I, 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 I go and get wisdom from people who are actually operating in darkness rather than in light. And I honor other gods. God said, you shall have no other God before me. Like clean the house, clean the temple. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, this is loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And lastly, he says, who does not swear deceitfully, and that's loving people. See, there are people who claim to love God but don't really like people. There are people who love God but don't really treat people very well. You can find them. They love to come after people and condemn and hit people where it counts claiming it's in the name of God. But God said you can't separate the two. You have to love God, and you have to love people. Friends, this is everything. Because the Bible tells us if we do these things, if we have outward obedience with an inward integrity, and we love God and love people, we can ascend the very hill of God and stand in his most holy place. And out of that flows everything. Everything. Out of that flows our abiding with him and being with him. Out of that flows uh, all the things that we're praying and asking God to do in our lives. Out of that flows our ability to, to love people. And, and maybe you, you hear those things and you think, Pastor Josh, that's too much. I can't even do those things. I, I know that I don't have the capacity. I've tried to have inward integrity. I've tried to have outward obedience. I've tried to love God. I've tried to love people. And I keep coming up short. I, how do I even do these things? Well, Psalm 24 continues and shows us. It says, you will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of your salvation. This is the divide in the waters right here. This is where many of us miss it. It says, you will receive a righteousness from the God of your salvation, such as the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Really, I, this, the key to the whole thing is in this second stanza of Psalm 24 in verse 5, that there's a righteousness from the God of your salvation. Charles Spurgeon talked about it this way. He said, it's possible right now that you're saying, I shall never enter into the heaven of God, for I have neither clean hands nor a pure heart. You came today and you're like, no, I'm blemished. I got issues. I've messed up. I've tried to look the part, but I know it ain't right. And I don't have integrity in the way that I'm living. You might be saying, I'm never gonna make it. Look then to Christ. Can we just focus on that part? Like, don't look at yourself. Don't try to be better or get better or fix it or think that you're going to handle it. The Bible says, if you don't think you're qualified to get up the hill into the presence of God, look then to Christ. See, some of you have been playing like the ho-hum game of I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. I, I can't make my own way. You're right. But you are worthy if you're in Christ Jesus because he's worthy. So stop being so self-obsessed looking at yourself and all your, all your issues and look to him because he is worthy. Look then to Christ who has already climbed the holy hill. He has entered as the forerunner of those who trust him. He did it so that you could do it. Follow in his footsteps. And right here, repose upon his merit. Most of us miss it because we try to get to God based on our own merit, based on the good that we've done, or we think we're disqualified based on the bad that we've done. But he says, repose, stop and think, meditate on, focus on his merit, not on your own. Repose upon his merit. He rides triumphantly into heaven, and you shall ride there too, if you trust him. But how can I get the character described, say you? The Spirit of God will give you that. The Spirit of God will give you that. He will create in you a new heart and a right spirit. Repose upon his merit. Do you remember that this whole gig about salvation and Jesus dying for your sin was all so that you could enter into God's rest? Not God's doing, 
and busying yourself trying to be worthy of the kingdom, it was so you could enter into God's Shabbat, shalom, into his peace. And some of you got saved and then you got busy because you thought you had to do a lot for Jesus. When God's true desire for your life is for you to get a new heart and a new spirit that just simply comes from being with him. You know, it's one thing. If you have a kid and all you say to that kid is do, do, do. Yeah. Fix it, fix it, fix it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. This morning, one of our staff kids really blessed me because I hadn't seen this kid in a little while and her mom sat her down and I love this little girl. And she came running right over to me and I got down on my knees and she hugged me and I picked her up and she just laid her head on my shoulder and she wouldn't let go. Do you know more than your good behavior, that's what God wants from you? Yeah. To run to him, to grab onto him. And, and if you'll just allow yourself to lean into him. God was teaching me last week, Josh, it's great that your theme and your anthem recently has been, God, you're worthy, you're holy, you're, you're awesome, you're mighty. As a man, I even kind of like to, that's how I like to relate to God. Like, he's strong, he's mighty in battle, we're going to kick butt for Jesus today. But I was just driving in the car and I had worship music on and I, God just spoke to my heart and said, I need you to tell me that you love me. And I just changed my tune and I said, God, I just, I love you. And I began to sing that and I said, God, I want you to be the object of my affection. I want to adore you. I want to praise you. I, I, help me to fall in love with you again. Now as a guy, I'm kind of like, <laughs> but in my heart, He'll create in you a new heart and a right spirit. See, there's some of us that if the snowplow had gone through this morning and cleared the road for you, some of you think, I'm not worthy of that snowplow. I didn't ask them to come. I didn't pay them to come. Why would they do that? Some of you are like, I did pay them to come. I pay taxes. They didn't get here soon enough. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to put that on Facebook. Stop it. <laughs> but some of us seriously think, some of us seriously think, oh, the snowplow came, but I'm not worthy of the snowplow. They didn't have to do that for me. That was too nice. And because you feel so uncomfortable that somebody would do that for you, you get your shovel out, and instead of just leaving, going where you need to go, you begin to shovel the road that's already been plowed, thinking, you know, I'm doing my part. I just can't drive down this road, this path that's already been created for me. I gotta, you know, I'm not worthy of that snowplow, and so I just gotta shovel my way, and so some of you serve Jesus. Oh, he already made a way for me, and there's nothing that I can do to receive it, but I'm still gonna flog myself spiritually, hoping that I'm worthy of what he's given me, rather than just taking the road that's already been marked out for you, that you couldn't get for yourself, but you only received because of him. Faith in Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit and has all virtues wrapped up in it. Repose, <clears throat> repose today upon his merit, not upon your own merit, but think long and hard about the peace and the rest that his Holy Spirit provides you because he is worthy of your life because he's your king. And in this last stanza of Psalm 24, in order to really understand it and do it justice, I gotta help you understand an old English custom that would take place when the king of England would travel back to the city of London and he would get to the city gate and as they approached the gate, a herald from behind the king would shout, open the gate! And everybody inside of the city would shout out, who is there? And the herald would respond and say, the king of England. And as you'll see in Psalm 24, it was such good news that the king had arrived that maybe they would repeat it again. Did you all hear that? Open the gate. Who's there? It's the king of England. And they would open the gate and the king would come in and the confetti would fly and they would cheer because the king had come in and he was among his loyal subjects and they would celebrate that the king had visited the people. Today Jesus stands at the gate and his Holy Spirit declares to you, open the gate. 
and you're sitting here thinking, I didn't even plan on coming to church today. I came because mom and dad told me to. I came because I really like this girl and I hope that if I come to church with her, she'll let me stay with her. But all of a sudden, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and the Holy Spirit's saying, just open the gate. And some of you are like, no, I shut that gate a long time ago because I've been hurt. I've been disappointed in God. And Jesus is saying, just open the gate. You have an opportunity today to welcome in the King of glory. Here's how it went in Psalm 24. It says, lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Who's at the gate? It's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Let's hear it again. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? He's the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of glory. Let's hear it again. Who is this King? He's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of glory. It's good news. It's worth repeating. It's why when Jesus rode into town on a donkey, they said, make way for a king. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this king? We know the Romans, we know the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but who is this king? That they put cloaks on the donkey and they lay palm branches and they shout, Hosanna, oh, save us. That they say, Hosanna in the highest. Who is this king? Who is this king of glory? But do you know that Jesus' entrance in Jerusalem on that day, where later he would be crucified, he would die on a cross for the sins of the world. God in the flesh would be slain for us. An innocent man dying in the way of a criminal. He'd be buried in a borrowed man's tomb, and three days later he would rise again. He'd spend a period of time with his disciples who would see him as the resurrected Jesus. And over 500 others who would see Jesus resurrected from the grave after he had clearly been killed on the cross. And then he would stand with his disciples and he would say, it's now my time to ascend to the Father, but the Holy Spirit is going to come and descend upon you. And before their very eyes, he rose up into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Later, persecution would come to the church and a man named Stephen would be killed for his faith And the Bible says that this same Jesus who had risen from the earth and was seated at the right hand of the Father, seeing the harm done to his follower, would stand up at the right hand of the Father. Still very involved and passionate about the affairs of his people. Still caring deeply about what you and I walk through in our everyday lives. But Jesus would ascend and he would go be before the Father. And when this happened, that Jesus is seated with his heavenly Father, Philippians 2, 9 records it this way and says, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Hebrews 1, 3 says, after he had provided purification for our sins by dying on the cross and being raised back to life, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Ephesians 1.20 says God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power, far above all dominion, and every title that can be given. You see these small kings who think they have worldly power. Jesus has been seated far above. The power in your life that mocks you and says, you'll never get out of this sin. You'll never be good enough. Jesus is exalted high above all of those things far above all rule and power and authority and dominion. John Newton wrote it this way, we conceive of Jesus therefore as ascending to his father and to our father, to his God and our God. And when Jesus ascended from the earth to heaven, perhaps he was accompanied with a train of worshiping angels who were behind him, who demanded admittance into heaven for the Messiah, the savior and friend of sinners, the king of glory, And perhaps as Jesus was ascending to heaven and back to his father, as he got near the gate, one of the angels cried out behind him and said, open the gate. And those in glory in heaven who did not understand the salvation of humanity said, who's there? And maybe the angel behind Jesus said, the king of glory, the Lord of all hosts, the Lord of all creation, 
Perhaps he cried out, who is this king of glory that's there? He's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Because the king being ushered back into heaven at that moment had died on the cross and rose again. He was the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord in battle because he had just battled the cross, battled sin, battled death, battled the grave, battled Satan himself and the lion of the tribe of Judah had overcome. And there will come a day again where Jesus will return to the earth. The Bible prophesies, it says that he won't come back as a baby in a manger, he'll come back as a king with fire in his eyes and a a, a, a sword in his mouth. And he'll set his foot on the Mount of Olives and the whole world will see it. Split the mountain down the middle. And Jesus will return for his people. And in that moment, all the kings of the earth who plot in vain right now will see him and will say, who is this king? All of heaven will declare, make way for the king. And the kings of the earth will respond, who is this king? And you and me and every other believer and follower of Jesus in all eternity will say, this is the Lord of hosts the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. This is the Lord mighty and strong in battle. This is our our God, strong and mighty. This is the Lord of hosts, the King of all glory. And we'll welcome him. And he'll come and he will establish justice on the earth. And he will establish his kingdom. But we'll talk about that next week. But the reality is even now, And for today, he reigns. He holds the keys of victory for all who might pledge their loyalty to the creator of the universe, who will accept the forgiveness of the Savior and offer to open the doors of their hearts to let the King of glory enter in. The Bible is clear. It says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It says many sit in the valley of decision. What will you do with the King of glory? because the king of all creation stands at the door and he knocks. And his Holy Spirit right now is screaming in some of your hearts saying, open the gate. Just open the gate. It's not by your merit, repose upon his merit. Open the gate. And you're saying, who is this king? This is a different Jesus than I knew growing up. This is a different Jesus than the other religions. This is a different Jesus than the spiritual practices I've been into. Who is this king? And I'm just the herald today saying, he's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He's the Lord of hosts of all creation, of all who were and all who will come. He leads legions of angels and and faithful followers throughout the ages. And he stands at the door of your heart. And you'd be a fool to not clamor around his presence and to rally to false kings who will meet their own end. So whether you knew him in the past and you've fallen for other kings or whether you've never let him be Lord of your life, today with the Holy Spirit, I would beseech you, make way for the king. Just open the gate. And when you do, he'll enter in. Aren't you glad that you don't have to go to him because he already came for you? And he'll enter in and there will be a rejoicing when the king even enters into your own soul and into your own life. None of us are good enough. We've all fallen short. But today we're worthy because he says we are. Because when Jesus stepped into heaven, he delivered his own blood into not a man-made temple, but a God-made temple in heaven. And that blood is enough for you to forgive you from every sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and to even cause you to release the shame and the guilt of your past life. So if you want to receive that today, if you want to open the gate, will you pray with me? Lord, we yield our hearts to you now. You are the Lord of all creation. You're the savior of the world and you're the King most high. (laughs) 
So Lord, if we've not already, open the gate to the King right now by confessing that we are sinful, by confessing that we're not able to save ourselves, but that your blood is able to save us. We ask that you would come. We believe that you are the son of the living God. You are the king of all creation. And we surrender our hearts, our preconceived notions, our doubts, all of those things to you right now. You are the Lord Almighty. And you stand at the door and knock, and today we let you enter in. Come and make your dwelling in us. Come and have your way in us. God, right now, we make way for the King. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen.